Civics 101 is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Civics, Civics. Civics 101. What do you know about the National Guard? Uh, I know the National Guard has offices in our city, in Concord, and they're all across the country. Yeah. Uh, well, what do you know about the National Guard? I know, well, I remember commercials that go something like, at the Army National Guard, oh. you can. <laughs> <laughs> you can what, though? I don't know what they do, necessarily. I'm not sure what they do. I'm Hannah McCarthy. And I'm Nick Capodice. And this is Civics 101. And today we're talking about the Army National Guard. Well, I'm curious what they do and how they train. I know they train on weekends. I'm pretty sure they're called in often for natural disasters, Mm -hmm. like evacuating people for hurricanes or things like that. Do they, like, have an air siren that's like, calling the National Guard? I think I know that it's the kind of thing that can help you pay for school. I'm also curious as to who authorizes the use. I know the president usually calls in the National Guard. Yes. All right, let's go. Let's go. My name is Miranda Summers Lowe. I'm a military history curator for the Smithsonian's uh, National Museum of American History. And I am also a member of the D.C. Army National Guard. National Guard history is my favorite, and no one ever asks. Oh, this is perfect. I <laughs> was so excited when this uh, came down the pipeline. Oh, good. We're so excited, too. So I guess we can just let's start there. Go into brass tacks here. What is the National Guard? The National Guard is this really unique organization. Um, Most countries worldwide have a military and they have some kind of reserve component, but we are the only country that has this military organization that can be called out um, by the state and kind of has this state character and state control. And I think there's just... There's something very American about it. Um, When our country was founded, there were a lot of feelings that if you had um, this large standing army, it would be really expensive and it wouldn't be responsive to communities or representative of communities. So that decision that a bunch of people made in, you know, the 17th and 18th century, like it still survives and it's turned into this pretty incredible organization where people from all over the country kind of get together and they volunteer to do this amazing thing with their time, usually on top of whatever other job that they're doing as their full-time employment. What's a reservist? A reservist would be anyone in any of the branches of the service who is not full-time. So you would call that active duty. So those are people where their job every day is to put the uniform on and show up to their place of duty and do that. And a reservist would be someone who only does that when specifically um, ordered to. And so these, the weekends that you have to do, or they just just keep you fresh? Uh, Sure. So uh, (laughs) the the weekends that you do are to, to gain that training. And then also to get to know the the unit that you're in and build that camaraderie and that teamwork. Does every state have its own National Guard or is it just one large organization? Every state has its own National Guard. And probably the biggest thing that makes the National Guard different than other reserve components would be the state control and the state identity. So there are actually 54 National Guards. One for each state, and then the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and... Guam? I miss? Guam. There we go. Thank right. you. So can you describe for us a little bit what that whole process is like, how you sign up, and then once you're in it, what you're doing? You sign up. Most regular recruiting stations can do it. You know, you decide which branch of the service you want to be in. In my case, I knew I wanted to join the Army, and um, there are specific National Guard recruiters. There are also some uh, multi-component recruiters. So you talk to one recruiter and they can help figure out if the best fit for you is to go active duty or Army Reserve or National Guard. You go to the same military entrance processing station um, that anyone joining the military would. You go through a physical and they look at your um, your test scores. You take a test called the ASVAB. Um, I like that name. ASVAB. <laughs> it does sound Good. I know a lot of people take that in high school. Um, you know, I, I hadn't. So when I went in, I had to. Is it a, a written computer. test or a physical test? It's a written test, like a physical with a doctor. But other than that, you don't get a physical test until you get to basic training. So you don't have to prove that you're physically fit enough to actually sign up for the National Guard. 
No, I think most recruiters will try to get you to do that on your own. And then, so once you're in it, um, what does that look like? What do you do once in the National Guard? So everybody who joins the National Guard starts out by going to the initial entry training for their branch of service and their job. So for me in the Army, that was Army basic training, and that's the same no matter which component you go to. And then you go into your specialty training. My first job, I was in supply, so I went to the unit supply school. We definitely want to hear more about what it's like to be in the National Guard, but I am so curious as to why we have... Is it like the army that stays in the U.S.? Is that why it was founded? If you go back to why the National Guard was founded, when our country was, you know, starting to take root, when, you know, we were building the colonies, there was only a National Guard or militias. You know, if you look through really like the first hundred years or so, if you look at the roots of the National Guard, um, you have these militias in places like Virginia and Puerto Rico and Florida, long before you have a federalized government. The National Guard says that our founding date is in 1636, even though, you know, we had wow. (laughs) the regular army, their founding date is in 1775. So there's this whole heritage of these kind of locally controlled voluntary armies long before we have this kind of larger standing army that stays on active duty. So Hannah and I both, in the context of what does the National Guard do, we both, the first thing we said was calling out the National Guard. Like, it's this thing that happens. So can you tell us, like, who does that and what happens when you're called out? So there are... um, Three basic ways the National Guard can be used. Uh, Two of them are state-directed. So Title X is federalizing National Guard troops. That happens to send them overseas when you think of, you know, hearing about maybe a National Guard unit going to Afghanistan. And it's when, like, some extra people are needed. Like, we we need more people in a certain place, so we're going to go to this this branch, which is usually reserved for America, uh, and take them to other places. Correct. Okay. The other two statuses, so state active duty and Title 32, that's when you're under state control. And that is typically used for things like disaster relief. So that would be like if if a town were to be flooded, they might send in the National Guard to evacuate people? Or would the National Guard show up after the, you know, the evacuation had happened? This is where, you know, it is kind of confusing and there's a lot going on with all these different statuses. But in the case of a flood, like you mentioned, the governor of that state might decide to call out their National Guard on state active duty, which is entirely within his or her control, for two or three days to help with evacuations and filling sandbags and setting up medical care facilities and all these other things. Then after that flood hits, it may become a like a federal emergency management area. And at that point, the federal government may decide to keep those same people on federal duty. And so they would use the Title 32 status for that. The president can call on the National Guard. The governor can call on the National Guard. Is that the only two positions that can make use of the like the call out? Right. And when, you, when the National Guard gets called out, you're a reservist. How do you get contacted? Like, what's what happens when the call is made? Did it used to be pagers or did someone just call everybody? I do remember the days of, of phone trees, you know. <laughs> um, I, I remember once being in college, and that's how far, for, just for this practice to see how fast they could get a hold of me. Like, the department secretary knocking on the door of my classroom and, like, pulling me what? out. Whoa! That's, I mean, I guess they really you need you. Gotta get burned on this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's in biology class. There's some pretty great automatic systems. So, like, I don't know if you've seen this in other areas, but um, where you get those, like, emergency alert messages on your cell phone. Oh, yeah. yeah, for, yeah. Like, Amber it's kind of like or, an auto. Yeah. Right. Um, so within units, they can set that up. So you get, like, a robocall, a text message, and an email all at the same time. I'm wondering about when that buzzer goes off, you know, is there like a little thrill of like, whoa, something's happening and we're going to like jump in and go do it? Like, is it? I think everyone has their own personal experience. Uh, my time in the National Guard, I've always really 
enjoyed those kinds of disaster response missions. I think that was one of the things that motivated me to go. On the other hand, I know for a lot of people, you know, especially in like a a serious disaster, the, the responsibility to go report for your National Guard duty means you are probably leaving your family and friends and your home in a rather precarious state. So you're walking away from you know, say the tree that is blocking your driveway to go report in and and try to help your community. And that's a hard situation to be in. Once you're called out to do some relief work, for example, do you stay there until the sort of mission is done? Like, do you sleep in tents? Is there barracks set up for you folks? Sure. It all depends on the situation. I live in Washington, D.C., so most of the time we can stay in the D.C. armory and you'll kind of like set up in kind of like a big gym. And some of these kind of larger scale disaster relief events, it it becomes kind of routine um, where people can either get back and forth to their own homes um, or like I spoke with someone who during Hurricane Katrina, uh, they were billeted or like they were living in a fraternity house at Tulane University. Like That (laughs) was the arrangement they'd set up. So when it comes to the history of the National Guard, there's all these moments that are just sort of in my mind, the National Guard was called out to do X. And I think the one that's most prevalent for me is uh, Kent State. But I know very little about what actually happened at that time. Is that something you could tell me about? Sure. There's a law passed in 1878 called the Posse Comitatus Act. And that basically that's said a great that. Name. Posse Comitatus. <laughs> it's amazing. So I go on. <laughs> I actually just looked that up and... Um, Yes, there is a Latin root to posse comitatus. It basically means to like bring your strength together. But we get the um, word like a posse. Oh. Exactly. That's where it comes from. And so within this posse comitatus act, it basically says that federal troops cannot be used for law enforcement. However, state troops can be used for law enforcement. There it is. There it is. Right. So during the 1960s, the National Guard was used quite a bit for civil unrest. You see a lot of National Guard call-ups around 1968 um, at the death of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, specifically here in D.C., and at Vietnam protests. So the Kent State event, that is an instance of State National Guard, the Ohio National Guard, being called out um, in kind of a law enforcement function, supporting local law enforcement during a protest that protest uh, turned violent and is one of those moments where I think the National Guard as an organization kind of stepped back afterwards and and looked at our relationship with uh, the communities that we serve. Now, the National Guard is still used in that role. You know, as recently as um, this year, we have had National Guard troops at the Women's March or at the March for Our Lives. And Most of the time, people appreciate having the National Guard there. We tend to be something, a presence there where, you know, you can kind of feel like there's more security there. But, you know, these are people from your own community. So aside from the Posse Comitatus Act, what what has happened that has changed the way that the National Guard can operate? There's always kind of been this evolution of the National Guard before between how much state control you have and how much federal control you have. Until about 1903, state National Guards were funded either through the state or personally. So specifically, officers would come in, they'd pay dues, they would raise the regiment. Mm -hmm. Um, You might have vastly different uh, uniforms or equipment from the unit one town over or especially across states. So the Constitution kind of outlines as far as, you know, having a militia that the state can train it however it wants to and select their own officers, but it has to be to a certain standard. Okay. And so that all really changes in 1903 with the Dick Act, who who was named after Major General Charles Dick, uh, who was a congressman and uh, a member of the Ohio National Guard. That's kind of the first time that this trade-off happens where the federal government comes in and says, you know, we want more oversight of what is happening in the National Guard. And then in exchange, they pay for more. It isn't until 1903 that uh, the federal government starts paying for some equipment. And um, at that point, you got five paid training days a year. 
Uh, how many now? So now the typical National Guard commitment is 38 days per year. We were both talking earlier about um, Little Rock after the uh, desegregation uh, laws were passed. Could you tell us about that? That's uh, another kind of interesting moment in National Guard history. National Guard troops were used all over the country as part of desegregation efforts. Now, in Little Rock, it happened to be this rare occasion where the governor of that state had actually called up their National Guard to keep the African-American students from going to school. It is very rare to be able to use federal troops for law enforcement and If you look at the pictures, that is the case where then the president called in the 101st Airborne to escort those students in. So if you look at the pictures from Little Rock, there's state National Guard troops and federal troops there. Oh, wow. If Title (laughs) 10 is invoked, can a governor say, no, Mr. President, my National Guard will not be doing that? In no way am I like any kind of constitutional scholar, but... (laughs) Essentially, the the president does get to call out the National Guard, um, and and that does um, outweigh the governor's objection. But that is a question that is constantly in flux. Probably one of the more um, recent moments where that came up was uh, during Hurricane Katrina. You know, we had hundreds of thousands of National Guard soldiers mobilized in Iraq and Afghanistan, so there was kind of a big shortage of National Guard troops for hurricane relief. At that point, some of these governors started stepping up, and particularly with things like um, aviation resources, so like helicopters, which are hugely important in disaster relief, saying like, you know, we, we want more of a discussion when our helicopters leave the state, especially in states that are, you know, say like in the hurricane belt. Is there anything that you'd want America to know about the National Guard? I think one of the things I find really interesting about the National Guard is how diverse it is. Over time, particularly since 1970 and, you know, we became a country that doesn't use a draft or conscription anymore, we tend to have these communities that are very military friendly and everyone joins the military and largely those communities are are in the Midwest and the South. But then we have the National Guard, and that is an organization that, by design, is spread out equally across all the states. And it brings in all kinds of interesting people. And and because it's not a full-time commitment, you bring in all of these people who have other things going on in their life. There are teachers, there are doctors, there are lawyers, there are police officers, and they kind of come together to do this thing to serve their communities one week in a month, but you get this just huge array of, like, life experience. That was Miranda Summers Lowe, military historian for the Smithsonian at the National Museum of American History and a member of the Army National Guard. This episode of Civics 101 was produced by Ben Henry. Our executive producer is Erica Janik, and our staff includes Taylor Quimby, Jimmy Gutierrez, and Justine Paradise. Music in this episode from Jazar. And if you have any civics questions that you'd like Hannah and I to get to the bottom of, just drop us a line at civics101podcast.org. Civics 101 is a production of New Hampshire Public Radio. Thank you.